Okay, in the 1972, 1973, 1974 Milwaukee Brewers were still slugging out for last place most of the time. Still, there was improvement. In uh, the 70s, Topps was the only major card company, and it seems like they weren't trying very hard some of their time. Even the local issues and food issues most of the time were a little flat. Uh, but let's talk about what there was to collect during that time. I, I could have got that Hank Aaron card I always wanted, but instead I hired these two. So <laughs> I hope that was a smart decision. Well, the uh, 72 uh, t Tops issue was pretty attractive, kind of an exception for the 70s. And they made 28 Brewer cards. The team finished 65 and 91. A lot of painted hats and pictures at angles so you can't see the hat. Again, a lot of player turnover. Uh, former Brave Del Crandall took over the team in May. And Billy Canagliano, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. He actually quit the team in June. That's how bad they were, I guess, or at least to him. Uh, Jim Lonborg was the ace of staff with 14 wins and a 2.83 ERA. Johnny Briggs led the team with 21 home runs and George Scott won his first of five consecutive gold gloves. Still at 600,000 roughly, attendance hit the all-time Brewer low. Now because the Senators became the Texas Rangers that year, they moved west and the Brewers became part of the American League East. Uh, Kellogg's made a card of Bill Parsons. Uh, ten Brewers were included in the Milton Bradley game. Uh, OPG made 18 Brewers. Again, the backs are the big difference on those. 7-Eleven made cups of Jim Lomborg and George Scott. Ellie Rodriguez was on a Topps candy lid. Uh, six brewers were on the Venezuelan stamps. Uh, they're called the Cerveceros, which is Spanish for brewers. You know, in recent years, they have a Cervecero night uh, once a year. Uh, I found a record made for the brewers. Uh, I haven't listened to it, uh, and all, always there's always the programs and whatever. Um, in 1973, Tops made 26 Brewers. I think it was a kind of a weak year in the design department. Uh, 74 and 88 was their record, so they got a little better. Uh, they actually had their first 300 hitter, actually two of them, George Scott and Dave May. Uh, they also got their first 20-game winner that year, which was Jim Colburn. Now, Don Money started playing uh, for the Brewers 145 games. Gorman Thomas played 60, and Charlie Moore got into eight games. So there's three key guys for the future. Uh, Jim Slayton was the number two guy in the rotation. 1973 also introduced the DH. Kellogg's made an Ellie Rodriguez card. OPG made 26 Brewer cards, well, same as Topps. Uh, 7-Eleven made an Ellie Rodriguez cup. Uh, they also had pinups and candy lids by Topps. Uh, they both featured George Scott. Now, candy lids were on candy cups made by Topps and not very widely distributed. Uh, and not a big set of players either. So, mostly the stars of the game. The Brewers were lucky to even have a guy on those. Now, the lids were round and had a player, you know, on the lid. Uh, I I don't know what the candy was, and I don't have one to show you. Uh, there are six Brewers on Lynette Portraits. Uh, Lynette Portraits made uh, at least basketball and baseball and all different players. Uh, they're rather nice pencil drawings, but they're hard to find now. Um, I also have some difficult to date stuff. Uh, you know, they made similar things in multiple years. Uh, in 1973, also, Robin Yount was drafted third overall, right after David Clyde and John Stearns. Ouch. 1974, Tops made 28 Brewers, including two from the traded set. That's the first time they've ever made a traded set, issued toward the end of the year to catch all the transactions. Kind of boring looking cards again. In 1974, a 12 card pack cost 15 cents. Uh, for the first time, 
you could buy a, a package complete set from Sears or JCPenney. Tops had never before issued a complete set ready at the start of the season. And that's probably what made them squirm a little bit when transactions happen, and that's why they came out with the traded set toward the end. Uh, there's two versions of all the Padre cards, too, in 1974. Curiously, the exception was Dave Winfield, rookie. But they were so sure that they were moving to Washington, they put Washington on all the cards, and then it didn't happen, and they made another issue of cards with Padres on them. Anyway, the Brewers hold... Uh, hold a record this year of 76 and 86. And Robin Yelp played his first full year, but wasn't on any cards until the next year. Uh, Jim Gantner was drafted in the 12th round. Uh, Dull Crandall ordered everyone to leave the 18 year old Robin Yelp alone. Don't give him advice, he'll figure it out. Kellogg's made a Dave May. OPG made 23 Brewer cards. Um, Tops made three Brewers on Deckel Edge cards. Those came back, but they're bigger and uh, tougher to get than previous years. I don't even have one. Uh, Tops also made 10 Brewer stamps and an album. Now, that the stamps came on bigger sheets, and you broke them up and like, put them in an album if you wanted to. Uh, and all the guys on the edges of those stamps are cut, like, short. <laughs> Well, the event of 1974 was Hank Aaron hitting the home run to break Babe Ruth's home run record. Now, former former Brewer Al Downing had the honor of serving it up. Uh, there's a bunch of extra Hank Aaron cards in the set, but uh, and I want to give you a little lesson in card collecting here too. Uh, the quality matters. A card is judged by the amount of damage it has, and the quality of printing and the cut. So, surfaces should be perfect with no scratches or marks. Edges and corners should have no wear or damage. Uh, 1975 is usually the line between vintage cards and modern cards. Uh, vintage cards kind of get the distinction because production was a lot less. Usually only kids collected cards and there was nothing made to protect them. Uh, the cardboard was almost always bad. Kids kept stacks together with rubber bands and wrecked them that way. Um, perceived value was almost nothing, and moms had a tendency to throw them out more. Uh, centering is a big issue in cards, too, it, <clears throat> and becoming more and more of an issue. Uh, so many cards were slightly miscut. There's a premium on a well-centered card. Uh, companies have popped up to grade cards, you know, to assess how good they are, I guess. Um, and they've all kind of worked out their own system of scoring them or, you know, judging them. Uh, they'll also check to see if a card is authentic in it, or if it has been trimmed or altered or fixed or even counterfeit. Yes, counterfeit cards are out there. That happens. Um, some people love graded cards. I mean, all that work is done for them uh, and, and another plus is that you don't have to actually see and touch the card yourself to know what you're buying so the online market has um, gotten help from the grading or vice versa um, I think grading is not as consistent as it should be and I'm a th pretty good judge of condition myself so I rarely buy a graded card Plus, it costs money to have them graded, so everybody wants a little more money for them to cover that. Um, I don't know why you'd send in a twenty-dollar card to have it graded when it comes, you know, when it's clearly like a three or four out of ten. You won't get much money for it. You won't get your money back <laughs> for the grading. No, it still happens for some reason. Well, that was the seventy-two, seventy-three, and seventy-four years. Tune in next time for 75 and 76. I hope you enjoyed it. They did.